<clears throat> All right. Uh, the modern church has become something of a spectator sport. You know, when I think of uh, a, a, a modern sport that um, I think of like the church a little bit, I think of the sport of hockey. You know, hockey isn't very popular, right? Just like church, right? Is church popular? Church isn't really popular. I, I actually love hockey and I love church too. So, you know what, maybe, maybe there's something behind that. Any hockey fans in the room? Anyone? Just one, one and a half, one, two? It's, hey, listen, it's a fun sport to watch live. A little harder to it doesn't doesn't play out on TV the same. Playoff hockey, oh man, I, I'm telling you, and the Rangers this year, right? But uh, not the Bruins. There's, there's Bruins. You know, I don't know who would root for a team like that. But uh, you know. anyway, uh, oh hey, there's a hockey fan right back there. All right, young a young hockey fan. So um, you know, it's a pop. It's it's not a popular sport, but the people who like it really like it, right? If you're, unless you're from Canada, right? Everybody loves hockey in Canada. But yeah, that's kind of like the church. The church is a spectator sport. It's, it's an unpopular one, like hockey, but those who, who like church really seem, seem to like it. The, the problem is that too many people see church kind of like they're viewing a sport. So... I like watching a game. I like going to a game. I like watching it. Uh, someone said, I, uh, Paul said live. Because I like watching the play develop. I like seeing, oh, you know, look how open that guy is. He can pass that thing down. I, you can't see that on TV as well. Whereas football, I'd rather see it on TV. I just don't like the live experience. I really don't. You know, it's just not, especially at Giant Stadium. You're so far up there. They look like little ants down there. You know, unless you're paying a ton. The last time I went, I couldn't even see, I couldn't even see anything. It was, I felt so far away. And I even went down low on the upper level, and it was still far away. But anyway, um, you know, with, 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 with church, they, people view it. It's like they view it. Some people only view church. They only look at it from their living room. And today it is hard enough to get people out of their living rooms. They prefer to watch church at home. Uh, to get people to serve in ministry and not just watch it is a whole different ballgame. Uh, people are busy. I understand that. And yet, busy people are willing to sacrifice their time and, and energy and whatever else. Right? How do I know this? Because I have a kid in sports. You know what I mean? And I see the work that people do in sports to have those sports go. I see the work of, that's involved in, you know, Little League, or in, in our situation, it was Cal Ripken, and all the, all, the, all the parents' work that they would do in changing trashes and running snack shops and all these different things, right? Organizing stuff, having meetings. People are willing to do stuff. The unfortunate truth is, though, that much of the time they're not willing to prioritize service in the local church. And then there are those who used to serve in local churches, but then their attitude changes. They think things like, I've put in my time. I've done my time. I've done my work. As if there's a certain amount of service and a certain amount of work that kind of entitles you to ministry retirement, right? Uh, today's message is for people who don't really serve in the local church. And I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, here. Uh, <clears throat> but there are also some thoughts for people who are serving. And so listen up, Jesus has some, some pretty important things, I think, for us. Now, just as a reminder of where we are, it's been, this message was supposed to be spoken three weeks ago. Then it was going to be given two weeks ago on a Sunday night. And I don't remember exactly how the whole thing played out, but it's about three weeks late. So um, it was due to Abby's wonderful uh, basketball shooting a little bit that uh, we got delayed on this thing <laughs> a little bit. But um, we're in the final week of Jesus' earthly life, and he's been serving for about three years. And some people have placed their faith in him. Others have placed themselves against him. <clears throat> At the end of John 12, Jesus preaches his final words in public, like his, final, like his public teaching ministry ends. And from John 13 through John 17, it's really everything kind of becomes more private at this point. 
So for the rest of this gospel and for the Passion Week itself, so John 13 through 17 is all private between Jesus and his disciples for the most part. And then John 18 and following is really the arrest, uh, trial, if you want to call it that, uh, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus in John 18, 19, 20, and 21. Uh, <clears throat> in today's passage, we approach the Last Supper with his disciples. And at that time, it becomes how much Jesus loves his own. Now, before the feast of John 13, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. And then the sentence continues, but we're going to stop for a second. So what we have here is kind of like a setting. We kind of have like a setting the stage, so to speak, right now for what's going to actually happen. We haven't really had any real verbs that took place yet, at least in the original language, apart from the fact that he loved them to the end. Uh, the, the real idea hasn't happened yet. All of this is kind of like... These are facts that are in existence before anything takes place. And so, again, this is all stuff that happens before the Passover meal. Before that meal, Judas has already decided to betray Jesus, to a certain extent at least. You know, you see here that uh, during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him, uh, Jesus knows that his hour had come that he would depart out of this world. Satan's plan is about to be carried out. Now, little does Satan know, at least as far as we understand, little does Satan know that the very thing he thinks is his victory is the thing that's his defeat, right? Destruction of Christ, or his physical body at least. Jesus is about to lay down his life for the sins of the world. And that is the great expression of his love for them, for us. <clears throat> Jesus loves us with an everlasting love. He loved them to the end. Now, what this means here, and I think it's fairly clear from context, we're dealing with completed action. Uh, the end is not the end of the, the, the end of time here. This is a reference to the end of his earthly life. All right. He loved them. This is completed action. Really, Jesus sacrificed for them right until the moment he breathed his very last breath on the cross. He loved them to the end. Of course, it's consistent with what we see in passages like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loved the world. Well, anyway, so they're about to sit down for a Passover meal. But then Jesus gets up from the table, all this being true, Jesus gets up from the table and does something extraordinary. Now, when I use the word extraordinary, I mean something that's not ordinary, okay? So I know it's, you know, if you think about it, it just makes sense, but extra ordinary. This is not something that's typical, all right? Jesus does something that's extraordinary in verses three and four. Jesus, <clears throat> knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. So he gets up from the table, he lays aside his outer garments. He is about to serve his disciples. So he takes a towel and a water basin, which are the tools of a slave, all right? And look what he does in verse five. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And as I said earlier, this is extraordinary. This is not, washing someone's feet is not a typical action, especially for a teacher to his students or from any Jew to any other. In fact, washing feet, for someone to wash someone's feet 
Jewish, the Jews wouldn't even allow Jewish slaves to wash a guest's feet. So um, this, is, this is atypical, all right? If a Jew had a non-Jewish slave, they would, let, they would let the non-Jewish slave wash a guest's feet, but not even a Jewish slave would do something like this. Now, foot washing did take place in, in Bible times. Uh, and what I mean is uh, water was given to guests and they washed their own feet. That's what happened. So um, in the ancient world, it's like, you know, we have shoes. I, I, pr I prefer shoes. I like shoes. You know, the Bible says, how beautiful are thy feet with shoes, right? That's the King James. That's, you know, I think in another translation, it says sandals, but whatever. You know, so, uh, so I like shoes because they protect, you know, especially if you're an athlete, they protect. I just heard uh, ben, ben was telling me a story Friday night about how he, 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 well, he like na na gnashed up his toe or something. He was playing something and, and really damaged his toe, broke his toe or something like that. I don't remember the exact story how it went, but he, was, he wasn't wearing shoes and he, and he injured himself badly playing sports, uh, dislocated, it, yeah, it like, it like broke off and then he put it in place and then they had to like break it off again and do something and put it in place and he said it was the most painful moment of his life. Uh, Abby, did you hear that story? Were you? Yeah. Playing flag football, there you go. Yeah, don't do that without shoes on. <clears throat> we have shoes to protect our feet, but you know, these shoes also kind of keep our feet clean. Now listen, if you only wear one pair of shoes, like, you know, if you're an athlete, and you have one pair of cleats or whatever else like that for your sport, you know, listen, do the right thing here. You know, use foot powder, whatever you gotta do. Do the right thing for your parents and for everyone in your house, just do the right thing. <clears throat> but young boys, you know, do they do the right thing with that? They're young boys, they, they, just played, they just played a game, they just sweat in those same cleats they wore every practice and every game and they take those shoes off and oh man, it's just windows down, throw the cleats right out the window. It's, it's not something you want. But uh, when you're in Israel, so like we, you know, we have shoes and we walk on, you know, we walk on pavement, right? We're out, we're out on pavement or uh, people are up in Main Street today. A few, a few of our people were up at Main Street and they're walking around concrete roads. In the ancient world, they did have some roads, Roman roads, but, but in many places, it wasn't like that. It was, it was dirty and even um, sometimes even like urine and stuff like that in the streets and and when I was in Israel, as I've mentioned, you, you know, we walked around and, uh, to the ancient sites, which, by the way, if you go to Israel, it's like you get to see like this wonderful pile of rocks that are like 3,000 years old, and it's awesome. And then the next day, you go see another wonderful pile of rocks that was 2,800 years old. And then the next day, you see a third pile of rocks that was 25. No, I'm just teasing. It was, I mean, it was that, but it was more than that. I mean, you, you know, you're like, this is like Jesus was here teaching on in the synagogue that was under these ruins you know and stuff like that. so it was, it was pretty cool but you'd walk through a place and and you'd get back on the bus and uh your shoes were filthy so you know I, every time i'd get back on the bus i'd have to get i'd have to clean i'd have to wipe my shoes off that's how dirty they were my shoes got filthy on that trip and so if you're in the ancient world and you're walking around and let's just imagine you're wearing sandals and you're walking on dirt roads and stuff like that. You, you, you know, you just take a hike up the mountain. When you're done with that hike, your shoes could get pretty dirty. You know, when it's, when it's, a, when it's a dusty dirt road, you're going to get dirty. And so you walk into a house and it was pretty customary. Here, here's water to wash your feet. That's what we see in the Old Testament. It's pretty common. We see it in Genesis 18. We see it in Genesis 19, Genesis 24. Uh, we see it in Luke 7. So... Uh, Washing your feet was a common thing. It's the, the closest I could get to it today is maybe, you know, um, I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess in the context of our last two years with the pandemic and everything, when you get home, you want to wash your hands. Or sometimes before you leave the building, you'll wash your hands, you know what I mean? Or something like that. And I know maybe some of you are just like, I don't want to wash my hands. Bring it on, baby. You know, whatever. But that's not me. When I get home, I want to wash my hands, even if I didn't touch anything. I try not to touch anything, but then I wash my, you know, that's the closest that we, you know, that's the closest that I can think of in today's context. It might be like walking into someone's house and them saying, let me take your coat for you or something like that. But it was not normal for someone to wash someone else's feet, especially a person of high standing to do the foot washing. Again, it was a task reserved only for certain slaves. Later, some Christian women did wash the saints' feet. And we see a reference to that in 1 Timothy 
5.10. But for Jesus to wash the disciples' feet would have been unheard of. I mean, here we have the king of the universe acting like a slave. The most powerful person ever to exist acting like a servant. Listen to what Carson says about this. With such power and status at his disposal, we might have expected him to defeat the devil in an immediate and flashy confrontation and to devastate Judas with an unstoppable blast of divine wrath. Instead, he washes his disciples' feet, including the feet of the betrayer. Washed Judas' feet. Talk about heaping coals, right? <laughs> Washing the feet of the one you know is going to stab you in the back. Jesus is doing this great act of service, this humble act of service. And uh, Jesus' service is mentioned in other places in the New Testament in different ways. For instance, in Matthew 20 and verse 28, uh, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The Apostle Paul writes about Jesus' service in Philippians 2 when he says, Have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. What did the King James say? Did not re uh, I've, I've learned it this way so long, I forget the King James language. Did not count, count it robbery. Did not think it robbery to be equal with God. But this is, this is the literal translation. It's like, Equality with God wasn't something Jesus had to attain or reach out for, right? To grasp for because it was something that he possessed. So even though he existed in the form of God, did not, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Of course, for this reason, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Here, Jesus, the one who had glory with his father in eternity past, such that in John 17 and verse 5, he'll pray to glorify him. Uh, restore him to the glory that he had with the Father before the foundations of the world. Here's the most glorious one, humbling himself and washing his disciples' feet. For Peter, it's too much. It's too much to take in. So he came to Simon Peter. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Peter cannot comprehend Jesus' act of service. It's an unfathomable act in his mind, and so he objects. Notice Jesus' response. Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Listen, Peter, you don't understand what's happening just yet. You will. You will eventually. But for now... Peter needs to submit to his Lord even though he doesn't understand it. Peter can't accept that. For now, Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet! Never! And, uh, and this is the strongest possible way in the Greek language to negate something. All right, it's two, uh, two different negative words, two uh, the, 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 the two main ways to say no, like no, no, not no, never. You shall never wash my feet. This will not happen under any circumstance whatsoever. <laughs> it's just like, oh, Peter really understands, like he knows better than Jesus, right? He <laughs> thinks he knows better than God. <laughs> never shall you wash my feet. Look what Jesus says. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. It's a conditional statement uh, for the sake of the argument. If this doesn't happen, assuming it doesn't happen, but we all know it will, right? Because Jesus is the divine Lord, right? Peter is just, you know, he's just a servant. If this were not to happen, but it will, 
you have no part with me. What Peter doesn't understand is that this act that Jesus is carrying out foreshadows something that Jesus is about to do. He's about to cleanse them from their sin through his shed blood on the cross, through spilling out his blood on the cross. And, and if a person isn't cleansed by faith in the blood of Christ, they have no part in the family of God. Anyway, Peter doesn't understand what's happening. He continues to object a third time, thrice, not once, not twice, but thrice, right? Uh, verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus says to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Uh, if Passover is coming, and it is, it's very likely that upon entering into Jerusalem, perhaps even each day upon entering into Jerusalem, they would have taken a ritual bath. In one of the many, many mikvahs, that's a ritual bath, like a place where they would take a ritual bath. And one of the many, many mikvahs that would lie scattered around the southern end of the Temple Mount, they would already have taken their ceremonial bath. And so they don't need to be cleaned anywhere but their feet. Uh, what they don't understand is the picture that's being presented, and it's a picture that people today don't understand either. Again, it's a shadow of the cleansing that's coming, a shadow of the cleansing that's coming through the cross. There is complete cleansing in the blood of Christ. Our relationship with God is perfectly restored through faith in Christ's work on the cross. By faith, they are clean. Foot washing doesn't accomplish that. And we'll see that here when he says, you are clean, but not all of you. Not all of you are clean. Uh, Jesus washes here Judas' feet, which is almost another one of those unfathomable things. And that kind of shows that foot washing does not provide the cleansing that Jesus is speaking of here. Uh, foot washing doesn't make a person clean before God. No work does. Baptism doesn't make a person clean. You know, some people misunderstand that. They think baptism cleanses, like maybe a little baby, cleanses him before God, and now, you know, he, he's safe because he's been baptized. You know, that's not it. You know, uh, baptism doesn't cleanse anyone. The Lord's table doesn't provide true cleansing. Only faith in Christ does that. And Judas doesn't have faith in Christ. And Jesus has always known that in John 6, 64. But there are some of you who do not believe for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. So what we have here is Jesus washing the disciples' feet and the disciples not understanding what this is about just yet. They have to understand that it's important. They just don't understand the significance of it. And so Jesus kind of explains to them a little bit about what this is about in verses 12 and 13, what foot washing was about, what Jesus washing their feet was about. So when he had washed their feet, and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Jesus is the teacher and Lord, and yet he humbly serves. The theanthropic being, the God-man, empties himself, humbly serves. And that service was an example for Jesus' disciples and for all disciples of all time. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example, and this word's important, we're going to look at this in a second. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Uh, now, there are some people who think that foot washing is an ordinance. Now, the Baptist church believes in two ordinances. We believe in baptism and the Lord's table. Uh, those people who believe foot washing is an ordinance base that on these two verses, okay? The problem is they misunderstand what foot washing is and they misunderstand the language that Jesus is using here. So Jesus is modeling humble service. That's what he's doing. He's modeling humble service. 
He's not creating an ordinance. We don't see this anywhere else in the New Testament. Baptism is, I mean, apart from the reference of, of, of uh, the older ladies in the church that would have washed, widows that would have washed the, the saints' feet. Uh, baptism is all over the New Testament, first off. And this isn't the kicker in the argument either. The Lord's table is all over the, all over the New Testament. The kicker is this word, example. The ordinances of the New Testament use an entirely different word. That's nothing like this. In fact, the word that's used for baptism and for the Lord's table is something more like the word for tradition. All right. Something handed down. Uh, that's not this word. Uh, this word is just an example. It's, a, it's, it's an illustration. Uh, by the way, you don't see foot washing in ancient church history either. Uh, and so the foot, the foot washers really kind of misunderstand what Jesus is saying. Ancient foot washing was a necessity in that world. The picture doesn't carry over today, and it's not commanded for the church to, to carry that out as well. The symbol has no meaning in modern culture. Now here we see this as an example, that they should do as Jesus did. That is, for them, humble service. And the humblest form of service in that day would have been to wash someone's foot. It would have been. Uh, you might say that today the humblest form of service is uh, cleaning toilets. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty, that one's, that one's down there, right? Anyone here? I love cleaning toilets. Just love it. Can't wait till I could clean. Now, maybe like a, like a young person might be like, oh, that seems pretty fun. I get to pour the thing in there. I get to, to do the little scrubbing, scrubby thing. And, you know, but eventually, you know, you come to understand cleaning toilets is not something I really want to be doing. Would we, would anyone, can I get a witness on that? Anyone agree with that statement? We don't want to be cleaning toilets. I'll do it, but I'm not going to be like, I can't wait to clean the next toilet. Oh, I can't wait. I remember we went to a football game and just using a toilet. I took a picture of one of these toilets. It was so bad. It was so bad. Someone threw up all over it. And uh, I, I mean, I felt bad for the guy who had to clean up that toilet. You know, cleaning toilets is a low, you know, there are some Christians who are too good. They're too good. I'm too good to clean a toilet. And if that's you, you know, you need to really hear this lesson because in my mind, you know, this example, what the word means, an example of behavior used for purposes of moral instruction. Again, completely different word than something handed down from Christ for the churches to follow. Uh, that this is an example of the greatest form of service you could carry out in New Testament times. Uh, I just, I made up the cleaning toilets stuff. I don't know. I don't know. You think of the greatest forms of service you could do, even in the church, and, and that's, the, that's, that's it. That's what Jesus is talking about, an example of humble service. These disciples haven't learned the lesson that Jesus taught just yet. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus' followers are not greater than Jesus. They are not too good for the most humble tasks. Uh, and I think that's kind of lost on the, the modern church uh, because the modern church has been too influenced by society, too influenced by Western thinking, by the, the prosperity gospel, by heresy. Uh, if Jesus did the most humble act of service of his day, we should be willing to do the most humble act of service in ours. That's what's, that's what's being taught here. This is not an ordinance. It's not something that's being handed down for all churches of all ages to follow. We don't find it being taught anywhere else in the New Testament. It's a completely different word. We don't find it in early, early church history. All right. But if Jesus did the most humble act of service of his day, we should be willing to do the most humble act of service in our day. And so I would ask you, are you willing to clean the toilet. Are you willing? Oh man, I could really run with this. Who would like to volunteer to clean the church's toilets this week? 
<laughs> we have a hand. I think you're on the schedule, right? I don't, she's on the schedule. So I might as well volunteer. I'm already on the schedule. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> I mean, it does count, but you understand. Who, who is willing to clean? Who's willing? Oh, man, especially during the pandemic, this one is. Ugh. Who's willing to wipe snot off a little baby's face? You know what I mean? Like, these are humble acts of service. Who's willing to change someone else's kid's diaper? All right, we got it, we got it, we got a young person. Okay, good, excellent. You know, there are all kinds. I, I, you come up with, so you can come up with better stuff than, I'm sure. I mean, these are, for me, these are like the things where I think of like, if, if there are, and I hate to say it, but I mean, it's just a fact. That's why I think they're lowly acts of service because there's some of the things that for me are like the, the, the least desirable things to think about doing. Anyone else have one that's down there? Maybe, maybe change an adult's diaper, right? That one would be down there for sure. What's that? Yeah, 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 changing an adult diaper or a bedpan. I think I, I think I choose the baby. <laughs> I think I choose the baby for, but you know, what, what acts of service are you willing? I mean, it could be, you know, now think in terms of the church. What humble acts of service can you carry out here? Now we don't, we, you know, our ministry right now is very simple. We don't have a whole lot of things that you can pick and choose from, but you know, humble acts of service could just be things around the property. It could be things like, you know, helping out with, uh, we're, we're about to start some junior church stuff up. It could be things like, Hey, listen, you know, and, and, and only maybe if you know the mother, hey, let me help you with your kid today. Why don't you sit in the service? Let me sit out with your kid or something like that. Or, or um, and I understand with the pandemic and all, I understand that that's, that's a little harder to do, but whatever. Um, let, me, let me cut the grass or shovel the snow or clean the toilet or whatever. Mop the floor. You know, we got a guy who won't let the people wash the floor here. Who won't mop the floor. He comes in here and he mops the floor so they don't have to do it. In my mind, that's a humble act of service. I think the deacons do humble acts of service all the time. Our Lord came to serve us. We need to serve each other. And so how can you serve your brothers and sisters in this place? And that is what Jesus expects of his followers. He doesn't expect you to come in here necessarily with a bucket and say, take off your socks, which you just showered this morning. Take off your socks and let me clean between your toes. You know what I mean? Like, you're missing the picture. You're missing the point, if that's what you think it is. Now, <clears throat> Jesus expects followers to do humble act of service, but not everyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus is what he says he is. And we see that in verse 18. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Again, Jesus knows who the betrayer is. He knows uh, who he is, even though he eats his bread. Judas is a deceptive and despicable person who will betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which some people would say would be months worth of money. He might look to the rest of the disciples at that point in time, he might look like a genuine follower of Jesus because he knows what they look like. He knows, he might even know the language that they use. And I don't mean like Aramaic or Greek or Hebrew. I mean, you know, in our case, Christianese, right? Because we talk about being redeemed, but we don't always explain that. We talk about the world, but we don't always explain it. We talk about being saved. They may even know the, the lingo, right? By the way, we really need to rethink some of that lingo because uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't use it. I'm just saying we should be more clear about it. Because if we say, you know, worldliness, that may not necessarily mean something to some people. It may mean something completely different or, you know, whatever, redeemed. Um, salvation by faith means something different across Christians. Like if you ask a Methodist about salvation by faith, they're going to use similar language we use, but they don't mean what we mean. They mean what we mean. So um, they don't mean faith alone and nothing else. They don't mean grace is not imparted by any means whatsoever besides God's grace through faith in Christ. So Judas looks like a genuine follower, but his actions show otherwise. And though no one, who, no one has achieved 
or attained to Judas great heights of wickedness. Many have attained to heights of similar treachery in the church, in churches. And there are a lot of people in churches who masquerade themselves the same way that Judas did among the disciples, such that when Jesus says, one of you will betray me, that each disciple's like, is it me? It's not me. Couldn't be me, right? Not me. Like, we have no idea. They're not looking, oh, <laughs> like, you would think they'd be like, it's Judas. It's definitely Judas. Right? <laughs> That's what we would be like, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. If I had to put my money on it, do this. They're like, is it me? Is it me? They have no idea. That's how good he was at masquerading himself. They have no idea, at least from the way it's presented. They have no idea that it's Judas. People like that pretend to be followers of Jesus, but they live a double life. Jesus, yes, has chosen his 12 disciples out of the masses of people that had at one point followed him, which we saw in John 6, we saw in John 15, but one of them is a devil. One of them has lifted up his heel against Christ. It's a quotation of Psalm 41 and verse 9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. In the psalm, a righteous sufferer is betrayed by an intimate friend. And um, that's what happened. Judas betrayed Jesus for the things of this world. And Carson calls it an especially heinous act. Jesus knows that this act of betrayal would be especially painful. He knows that it could even cause doubt among some of his followers. And that's why he tells them about it, so they shouldn't be surprised when it happens. It shouldn't affect their faith. In verse 19, from now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he, I am the one. Jesus knows that this betrayal is happening, but it's going to happen to fulfill God's plan of salvation. And then they would know exactly who Jesus is. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. This is something Jesus already said in John 5. He calls his followers essentially to place their faith in him. Receiving Jesus is receiving the Father. And he calls his followers to fellowship and to humble service. In this passage, we see one of the greatest and most humble acts of service in all of Scripture. I say one of the greatest because I think the greatest is clearly, well, you tell me what the greatest act of service in all of Scripture is. I think we would probably clearly, probably definitely, anyone ever say that? Probably definitely. Um, I don't really know what that means. I think that's kind of like jokingly saying most definitely. Uh, we would definitely say Jesus sacrificed on the cross, but here is one of the greatest and most humble acts of service in all of Scripture and yet it is nothing compared to Jesus' ultimate act of service on the cross. But the point is humble service. It's not the establishment of a third ordinance. Um, it is humble service. And Jesus calls his disciples to do humble service. For the believer who is not willing to serve, I think the message, the call for you is pretty clearly to repent. To repent, get right with God, find acts of service to accomplish for your brothers and sisters in the Lord, even if it's the most humble act available. Uh, I can even think of one family uh, who could really use some acts of service in our church right now. And um, if you're interested in that, come and see me privately and I'll, I'll tell you. For those who do serve, do it as an act of love for God. Don't do it for the accolades of man. Don't do it because now all of a sudden you look like some great thing. Look at all that I have accomplished. Look at this great Babylon that I have built. 
do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be a humble servant following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to commit to this type of service. And if you're not willing to serve, it may be that you have no part with him. Let's take our hymnals and turn to hymn 550. Uh, during...